Right, so we want to walk through this uh, PowerPoint, okay? So particularly for the IT guys, we, we did a little, we started a little bit of a thermodynamic um, tutorial yesterday. So we looked at conductivity with a small k and u value, which is the unit that we should be reasonably familiar with. So as the main difference between them is that conductivity is defined for a block of material that's a meter thick, uh, whereas the u value is just is defined for a structure that might be x millimetres or x centimetres thick. So thickness really is the only distinguishing feature between them. Otherwise, they describe the amount of energy in terms of joules that transfer um, per unit time, and per second, per metre squared area um, for every temperature degree differential. So you have temperature on the outside and temperature on the inside. How quickly will energy flow from hot to cold? That's essentially what the U value or conductivity means. Uh, resistance is essentially how resistant is a material to heat transfer. And of course, as you know, the likes of metal is not, does not have a high thermal resistance, whereas fiberglass does. So where you have a potential, a temperature potential across the surface, um, the resistance would dictate how much energy flows uh, across um, that surface. So it's a bit like uh, electrical circuits. So in an electrical circuit you've got an electrical resistance, you apply a voltage across it and you get a certain current. It's the exact same principle here. You have a temperature differential across a surface. The surface has a certain thermal resistance. And depending on the thermal resistance, you get a certain amount of heat flow in the same way as you would get a certain degree of current flow here. So it's the, it's the exact an analogy, I think, is the term I'm looking for there. Um, just to keep your eye on units, because I'm a stickler for units, um, again, it's defined per unit, uh, per meter squared of the material. So your heat flux is, you know, how many joules per second uh, per meter squared flow across uh, that meter squared um, of the material. So if you're to define thermal resistance, that's, that's what you have. You have your, 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 your temperature potential, which is equivalent to your voltage potential, and you have your heat flow, which is the same as your current flow. Okay? So the relationship between conductivity or U value and resistance is an inverse relationship. So we've seen that U, the U value is the rate of energy loss or gain, so watts, joules per second, per unit area, in other words, meter squared, per degree temperature, per degree Kelvin. Right. And I've taken these from the SEA, SEAI website. In fact, they're a couple of years old. There's probably more updated ones, but that doesn't really matter here. So there's some typical U values for your cavity wall. Right? So obviously, as you go from here, we have a timber frame. Uh, cellulose fiber, which is obviously a very high thermal resistance, the, the, the loss of, of energy is the lowest of them all, as opposed to here. Okay, 0.4. Uh, if you look at windows, I'm oh, sorry, that's uh, roof, which is of the same order really, uh, 200 millimeters, which is a lot, has a U value of 0.13. So that's per meter squared. That's how many joules of energy per second per meter squared per degree Kelvin difference. Windows. Single glazing, double glazing. <coughs> so what you can see here, I don't know what the triple glazing one. Anyone here know what, what the U value of triple glazing windows is? Where are the mechanical engineers again? I keep picking on you. Now. What's your name again? Declan, will you find out for us and send me an email? What is the U, what is the best U value for monster joinery triple glazing windows? Okay. Sorry. 1.9 to 1.7. Sorry. 1.9 to 1.7. Okay. 
and then you literally just add them all together. And that gives you the total U value for your house. And then you inverse that, and it gives you the total resistance for the house. So in other words, to work out the total resistance for a house, and you can see why we need that in a minute, in fact, you should probably already know that, you can do it this way, and spend your day at it, or you can do it this way, uh, it's much easier to do. Because you usually have the U values for structures, whether it's a wall, or a window, or a roof. And if you don't have them, I've given them to you. Alright? Okay, so, just one thing I wanted to run through, because actually I haven't looked at the most recent version of Simulink. But we were using it a couple of years ago for a master's student. So if you've opened up that demo, that's the one we used. And a guy built a model of the nursing library. I might have shown it to you earlier on in the year. And the funny thing is, what he found was that we could not keep the nursing library. So no matter what the temperature was, uh, no matter how much heat we put into the nursing library, we couldn't keep it warm. And this was using the MATLAB's we were building literally from MATLAB's uh, general. And what we found, and they may have changed it, in fact, we were, I'm not sure if you were right to them, suddenly the code was wrong, was that they were looking at the conductivity of glass. Uh, but in fact, and again, I'll come back to the core mechanical guys, I won't pick on you though this time. Declan, I won't pick on Declan. Energy system. Sorry? For energy system. Yeah, yeah, but he's a mechanical energy system. But, um, so if you look at a piece of glass, the glass has a certain material conductivity, but what dictates the energy flow through a glass? It's not just the conductivity of the glass, it's also the surface resistance. So you get a film of air on either side, and that actually adds to the overall resistance. So in fact the overall resistance of a window is the resistance of the glass, which is given by the conductivity, plus the surface exterior and the surface interior. And there's a lot of science behind that. And what we found was that the Simulink model was only looking at conductivity of glass. And as a result, um, so the reality is this. Essentially you've got uh, resistors in series. MATLAB were just looking at the glass. And actually what they were coming up with for figures just to show it here, you can work through it yourselves. I've given you some typical values there for surface exterior and surface internal resistance. I got those from Marcus and the Irish group. But as you can see, if you ignore the surface resistance um, and you just look at glass, the U value of glass, 78 watts per meter squared. Right? So 78, as opposed to if you include uh, the surface resistance, it comes right down to 5. Now as you know, really good glass with uh, triple glazing and single glazing goes right down to much less than 5. But essentially what we found was we couldn't keep the room hot because essentially the heat was just escaping straight out and what we were finding was that the temperature was following the external temperature. That may still be the case, so beware if you're using the Simulink demo, check that um, isn't the problem, or is, isn't still the problem. But in any event, using U values is much easier. Okay. Right. So let's move on to the actual um, workings of that model. So if you open up the, uh, the model, now I'm actually, in the, in the slides I'm using my own model, so it's a little bit different. Okay, so if you've got that open, if you double click on the uh, double click on the heater, okay? So this is this is not on blackboard guys, this is just go to the uh, command, command window in MATLAB and type in that, okay? Open up MATLAB and at the command window type in SL demo, simulate demo, underscore house heat. So if you double click on the heater, 
you get the heater. Uh, I'll show you how to do this later on. We're masking the detail behind that. Where is the heater? So, again, for the IT guys more so than the engineers here, uh, the engineers have done some amount of thermodynamics, you know that if you have a heater that's blowing hot air into a room, so we might have a heater in this room, I don't know where it is, but it doesn't blow hot air, it's a uh, radiator. But if we had an air blower, um, the amount of heat in joules per second that that heater can deliver is governed by three things. What are they? No. The mass flow rate, the kilograms per second of air, which is n dot. Okay. What else? Should be rolling off your tongue. The mass, the heat, heat flow is what? The mass flow rate multiplied by that. The temperature difference between the air coming in and the hot air coming out. Yes. So here we have m dot which is the mass flow rate, kilograms per second. Here is the temperature differential, which is the temperature coming out of the heater minus the temperature in the room. And what's the last bit? The specific heat capacity of air. So how much, how much joules of energy is there in a kilogram of air per degree Kelvin? Which is C. So essentially, this bit here is the amount of energy, joules per second, that the heater generates. So you are adding X amount of joules per second into your house. Your house is a certain size and you are adding so many joules per second into your house. Okay? Now, we'll come back to the heater switch in a minute. Okay, so the input from the heater in joules per second is the mass flow rate kilograms per second, the temperature difference between what the heater is generating and the current room temperature, which is Kelvin, and the specific heat capacity which is joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. Multiply all those units together and lo and behold you get joules per second. So how many joules of energy per second are going into the house? Alright? So that's the first part of the formula. The next part is um, how much how many joules per second are leaving the house in terms of heat losses? <coughs> All right. So how much, how many joules per second are leaving through the walls, through the window, through the roof? And we've just worked out how to do that. How do you work out the equivalent resistance um, for the house when you look at the walls, you look at the windows, you look at the roof? You multiply by the area and you get the overall house resistance. <coughs> Alright? So the heat flow um, out of the house is governed by the overall resistance of the house and the temperature differential between inside and outside. <coughs> Simple as that. Okay? So that's what you need to work out how many joules per second are leaving the house. What's the difference in temperature and what's the overall resistance of the house? So, um, so it's the temperature differential divided by the resistance of the house. So if you go to the model again, and go to the house, so click on the house. Alright? So, you see this bit here? So what you have here is the temperature differential, which is the outside temperature, the inside temperature. This is the temperature differential, and you're dividing it by, so if you're multiplying it by 1 over the equivalent value, resistance value of the house. All right? So what's coming out here is the heat losses. Right. So this bit coming up here is the heat exiting from the house in joules per second. This bit coming in here is the joules per second going in from the heater. So in, out. And the difference, essentially, is the net joules per second that are actually going into heating up the house. Does everyone get that? Okay, it's a simple uh, formula. Alright, so let's move on. Okay. 
So, we now know how many Jews per second are going into the house. So, what does that mean in terms of temperature rising in the house? What do you need to know? Intuitively, without looking at the slide, we know how many Jews per second are going in. What will dictate how quickly the room temperature rises? The size of the room. How do you work out the size of a room? Sorry, when you say the size of a room, what we actually mean is the mass of air in the room. Right? That's what you mean by that. Intuitively. How do you work out the mass of air in a room? You work out the volume of the room and you multiply it by the density of air at room temperature, or at 20 degrees. So, essentially, the mass of air in a room is essentially the volume of the house multiplied by the density uh, of air, which gives you the kilograms, the mass of air in your room that you are trying to heat up. So, you add so many joules per second in, and you want to work out well, how many degrees Kelvin per second will that result? in a temperature increase. So what you need to know is the mass of air uh, in the room, and again, we're back to the specific heat capacity of air. So how many joules of energy does a, a kilogram of air need to heat up by one degree Celsius? I mean, you all did this for your lead insert, the specific heat capacity of water, for example. This is just the same thing, it's the specific heat capacity of air. <coughs> If you go to a power station, what you'll find is the generators are cooled by hydrogen, which might seem like a very, very strange choice of gas, because hydrogen has a flammable range of what, does anyone tell me? I think it's 4 to 94 percent. So you get an explosion of hydrogen nearly, no matter what the percentage is. <coughs> but hydrogen is used to cool generators, electric generators. Why? Because it has a brilliant capacity for absorbing heat, much better than air. Um, so air-cooled engines, um, a hydrogen-cooled engine will work much better than an air-cooled engine in terms of its cooling capacity. But anyway, we're dealing with air here, obviously. So we want to figure out, if you have a net joules per second going into a house, how many degrees Kelvin per second increased temperature would that result in? So if you go to the model again, so what you have here coming in here is the net joules per second. You divide it by the mass of air in the house, which is capital M, which is different from lowercase m we spoke about earlier. This is the mass of air in the house by the specific heat capacity of air. So you have joules per second in on one side and you have degrees Kelvin, or degrees Celsius per second on the other. So in other words, if you add 100 joules every second into a room, the temperature will increase by 1 degree Kelvin per second. So coming out of here, we have, for every x joules per second, we get x degrees, or y degrees per second, uh, temperature increase. Then all we need to do is, as the model runs, we need to integrate Remember we saw the integrator yesterday? We need to integrate those differentials for every time step. So the temperature increases by 0.01 in the first time interval, and then by 0.2 in the next time interval, and then by 0.1 in the next time interval, and by, by 0.2. We want to add up all those increments using an integrator. So what comes out the far side is the actual room temperature. And of course, one thing we saw yesterday is that when you use an integrator, you need to specify the initial temperature setting uh, as part of the integrator uh, block. Okay, so essentially we have energy coming in from the heater, energy leaving through the walls, windows and roof, the net heat gain for the house, the net temperature change per second for the house, and then we accumulate it here to get the actual uh, house temperature. Okay, the thermostat. So if you go back to the overall model, the full size model, okay, if you go to the, uh, the top bar, yeah, you've got it. So remember, a thermostat is designed, someone asked me, 
in this class ask me, how do I, how do I um, get the thermostat and simulate? Well, it's very easy. Uh, your thermostat is, has a certain set point. Now remember, this is in Fahrenheit, so we convert it to Celsius, but we won't be doing that in our, in our lab. So you have your set point, you have your actual temperature. That gives you your error. So in other words, are we too hot or are we too cold? If we're too hot, we turn off the heater. If we're too cold, we turn on the heater. So you use a, 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 um, a relay uh, to determine what you're looking for in a library browser for that. And if you click on that, you see it there. There's your error. This is the difference between the, the target temperature and the actual temperature. And then the settings of the relay are given here. Now it's a bit complicated here because we're dealing in Fahrenheit. That's why you see all these 5 over 9s. Um, whereas in my one here, I'm dealing in Celsius. So for example, our target is 20 degrees. We want to switch on at 19. So switch the heater on when the temperature dips to 19. Switch the heater off when we hit 21. So in other words, the, the, the hysteresis, what, we want hysteresis in a switch. So we switch on when the error is plus one. Because the error is positive when the actual is less than the charge. And we switch off at minus one. So when we switch on the heater, we get a one on the output. So when the heater is switched on, we get a one. Why is that? Well, if you go back to the heater model, this is the amount of energy coming out of the heater. But remember, the heater only switches on when the thermostat tells it to switch on. So essentially, we have a product here. So when the thermostat kicks in, this becomes a 1, and we get an output from the heater. When the thermostat switches off, this goes to 0, and we get no heat out of the heater. All right, so that's how we model uh, the thermostat. The thermostat because it's very warm in here. All right. Okay, anyone got any questions? I know we're uh, going through this fairly quickly, but I. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, the difference between the model that I have here and the model you have is that in my model the outside temperature is read in from the workspace like I showed you yesterday. But, I mean, we, I'll show you how to do that next week. But in, uh, in Simulink you can see that the, the outside temperature is shown here. So what it is, it's, I showed you this already, it's a, it's a sine wave and uh, an average. So you're essentially you're adding a sine wave to a constant. This is in Fahrenheit, of course. Uh, so we have another conversion here. So that's the sine wave, which has an amplitude of 50, a bias of 0, and a 24-hour um, period. Okay. If you go to the integrator, this integrator here, Okay, so that's the integrator that integrates the temperature in the house. You can see that you have an initial condition here of T initial. So all these parameters need to be set. Remember yesterday I showed you that before you run your model you have to set all these parameters. Uh, there's a full MATLAB script running behind this model. And we look at that in due course. Where it develops all the, and sets all these parameters. So, before we switch to it, what are the parameters that that model needs before it can actually run? So if you, if you click run, the model will run. Right? So just click run there, and it generates some nice results. And if it doesn't, they have Okay. I'm getting there. So as you can see, um, 
can't really see it very clearly here, but you can see it in front of me. You can see the external temperature is purple. You can see the heater cutting on and off. Uh, these are in Fahrenheit, of course. And you can see the accumulated energy cost. Right? Okay. Uh, in terms of energy cost, look at this bit up here. So essentially what we have coming out here, coming out here, remember, is the, uh, when we actually have energy coming out of the heater, it goes into the house. But just to keep track of how many joules of energy the heater is providing, we need to integrate over time with those joules per second to get the total number of joules of energy going into the house because we're being charged for it by Electric Ireland or by Board Gas or whoever else our energy provider is. So that's what that integrator is for. And then we need to work out well, what is the cost of a joule of energy. So if you switch back to the um, PowerPoint here. Okay, so the outside temperature in my model is written from outside, and yours is from a sine wave. Uh, we need to work out the cumulative energy cost, and we need to set the initial inside temperature. So I took this from the single electricity market operator in Ireland. I took it on the 9th of February, which is yesterday, is it? Is today. Right. Okay. This was the um, this was the situation in Ireland, uh, the, the 32 county Ireland, by the way, um, on the 9th of February. So as you can see, they were expecting a peak of around 5,000 some hundred megawatts, and this was the price that was being paid to the generators. So as you can see, the minimum is uh, about. 3 cents per kilowatt hour, but at around 6 o'clock in the evening it peaked at about 17 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is the amount of energy, this is the amount of cents per kilowatt hour that every power station was getting at all times. I mean this is all done on, on, a, on a daily basis and it's worked out on a half hourly interval. That's the way the market works in Ireland. Now as you can see, um, we come back to these slides in a second, but the interesting thing here is if you go to the the cost, if you go back to your model, you'll see how that's done in, in simulating. So you have this variable called cost. And remember what's coming in here is what? What's being fed into the cost? Game. Don't all shout at once. Joules per second is what's coming in here into the integrator. So we integrate it then over time to get just joules. So it's the, it's the net joules per It's the net joules going into the house. To get the cost of that energy, sorry, no photocopiers. Okay. Uh, you multiply it by the cost. But again, it's the cost of a Jew, whereas we pay our electricity in uh, kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt, which is a thousand uh, joules per second, over an hour, which is 3,600 seconds. So a kilowatt hour is actually 3,600 kilojoules. So if you want to get the cost of a joule of energy, you divide your 20 cents or whatever you're paying in electric Ireland by uh, 3.6 million. That's the cost of a Jew. And that's essentially what you would feed in to your cost parameter uh, for your house. So whatever, whatever your energy provider is, whatever much they're charging you, that's the amount you feed into your, your cost um, gain. Okay. This is where I set the initial temperature of the house. I've already shown you that. And that's the output from the map that demo. That's not the, that's not the output from my code because obviously this is in Fahrenheit. All right? So, um, 
it's probably a good idea to, uh, first of all, have a look at that if you don't know what u-values are. But secondly, if you play around with that model, so, for example, you can change the initial house temperature, and you can see that if you set the initial house temperature to, let's say, zero, it takes a long time for the house to heat up, not surprisingly. And, of course, the cost will go up. Um, if you want to change other factors, it becomes a little bit more complicated because you have to go into the MATLAB script behind the model. So, just conscious of time. So, what are the parameters that you need to run this model? Before that model can run, what does it need to know? Cost of kilowatt. Sorry? Cost of kilowatt. Yeah, and that's determined by that variable cost. Okay, so cost has to be set in some script. What else? The initial temperature is set in the script as well, yeah? What else? Uh, the set point is hard coded, it's <coughs> there, actually it doesn't need it, it's all there. And similarly the thermostat, plus or minus are all set. That's all done. Okay, so that, that's, that's all handled. What else do we need to know? Intuitively, what do we need to know? If I ask you guys how much does it cost uh, to heat a house, what's the first thing you'll say? How big is the house? So the model needs to know what size the house is. So behind that model, there is a script running that figures out not just the surface area of walls, windows, and roof, but also what else do we need to know for the house? We've covered it already. The U value, yeah, once it works out the surface areas and the U values, it works out the equivalent resistance. What else? Did we work out? Temperature outside. Temperature outside we've covered as a sine wave here. The mass of air inside the house. So we need to work out the volume of the house as well. And using the volume of the house, we work out the mass of air in the house. And I think that's about it. So all those variables, the dimensions of a house, the surface area, which gives you the equivalent resistance of the house, the volume of, a, of the house, which gives you the mass of air in the house, the initial house conditions, the cost of energy, that, when you run that model there, the only reason it ran is because all those variables are specified in the model workspace. Um, so if you go to if you go to the model there and go to uh, model explorer, <coughs> and click on model workspace. this here, that's SL simulating, simulating, simulating demo house heat data. That's a MATLAB script, and that MATLAB script generates all this data for the model before you even run the model. So as you can see, there's a whole lot of parameters there. There's the length of the house, the width of the house, the height of the house, the pitch of the roof, the number of windows, the height of the windows, the width of the windows. Conductivity, again, I don't deal in conductivity, we just deal in new values, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, there's the equivalent resistance for the house. There's the specific heat capacity of air, C. Here's the temperature of the heater, but that was another one we need to set. The actual, how hot is the temperature coming out of the heater. If you increase the, the, if you increase the output temperature of the heater, what impact will that have? Why would you waste more energy? Just think about it. Actually, just think about it for a second. If you increase the, the output temperature of the heater, what's the impact of that? Will it cost any more to heat the house? Yeah? Will it cost any more energy? And will it cost any more euro? Why? It's on for less. So the answer is, it'll heat up quicker. So the gaps between those yellow lines, when the heater comes on, it'll heat up more quickly. But, you know, in theory at least, it won't cost any more energy. It depends on the efficiency of the heater. 
but we're not factoring that in here. You should find the cost is the same. It just means the heater, when it cuts in, the temperature shoots up more rapidly. Um, there's the mass flow rate of air, which is set by the heater again. Uh, the density of air, what is the density of air? 1.2 kilograms per, per watt. Per meter cube. Okay. Uh, so that's the mass of air in the room. That's the cost of energy per joule, 2.5 by 10 to the minus 8. That's a MATLAB, uh, very cheap energy cost in the States. Not nearly that cheap over here. And that's the initial temperature in the house, of 20 degrees. 